Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Magdalena Abrego. I'm an assistant director at Berkeley's Office of Alumni Affairs. And besides uh, working at Berkeley, I'm also an alumna of the college. I'm a guitar player and I'm also a podcaster. So I'm so excited for tonight's event. And I'm also joined today by a couple of my colleagues, Joe Driesen, Director of Alumni Affairs, and Callan Moody, who's also an assistant director. So shout out to them for being here. And shout out to all of you. I am so excited to be joined by such an all-star panel of podcasting professionals. Um, so today's event is going to be in two sections. The first portion is going to be a conversation among the panel around the state of the podcasting industry. And then we'll open things up to Q&As near the end. So if you do have any questions for the panelists, please add them to the chat. And I will be checking in on that a little bit later. So before we start, I wanted to let you all know that you can view previous webinars that our office has hosted online at youtube.com forward slash Berkeley alumni. One of my recent favorites uh, is the financial literacy workshop that we did, which seems to uh, grow in relevance daily. So I definitely suggest that you check that out. To learn more about some of our upcoming webinars, uh, I encourage you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and check out our alumni newsletter, which includes a comprehensive guide of everything that's happening uh, online. Cool. So that was a lot of business talk. Let's get to the podcasting. <laughs> so I'd love to start by just introducing everyone that we have here today. So I would love to start with Marcus. Marcus, good to see you. Um, so Marcus is a staff composer and engineer at Gimlet Media, whose work includes co-scoring with the Flaming Lips, composing for This American Life, and arranging for Showtime's The Affair. Marcus, thank you for joining us tonight. I thought maybe we could start by having you share uh, what program you were in at Berkeley, what your major was, uh, your grad year, and also what has been the best part of being quarantined at home? <laughs> um, so I was a film scoring and songwriting dual major. I think the year that I graduated, I was the only person with that dual. <laughs> So that was in 2012, I think. Oh. Um, yes. It's not that long ago, but it feels really long ago, particularly after the pandemic. Um, <laughs> and uh, my favorite thing about being quarantined at home, uh, it's just been uh, hanging out with my wife and my dog. Um, and my brother is also in my building, so I've been hanging out with him, so that's been really nice. Got it. That sounds awesome. And Marcus, how do you pronounce your last name? It's Bagala. Bagala. Okay, I wanted to get it right before I said it. Marcus Bullock, Bagala, everyone, and then I mess up. Okay, great. Um, and we also have another panelist who seemed to be kicked off, actually. So hold for some tech issues, but so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Let's go to Ray. Um, so Ray Kantrowitz is a freelance Hi. podcaster uh, who recently worked on developing a forthcoming season of Rule Breakers, which is an audio documentary series from the BBC and Sundance. Ray, can you share those same facts about yourself, like your major, your grad year, and your favorite part of quarantine? Uh, I would love to. Thank you for asking. Um, my major in grad year, I'm like trying to think back, you're right, it's kind of hard, uh, 2016 was when I graduated, so not too long ago. And then uh, I was pro music, which I really liked because I could take a combination of MP and E and EPD classes, and there was no core requirement for the entire major. So I actually, I mean, there's a little one, but it, it gave me the freedom to pick and choose from all the majors. Um, so I got to take film scoring, and then my directed study was in composition. Um, so it was kind of like a little bit of everything. Uh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Oh, and my favorite part of quarantine, I think, is that, um, well, I, I get to spend a lot of amazing time with my boyfriend who can't tour because of COVID. So we get to spend a lot of really great quality time together because the music world has kind of come to a halt. Uh, so that's the best part of quarantining so far. 
<laughs> nice, nice. Okay, so let's move on to Dan Radin. Dan is the Director of Product Marketing at Isotope. He has 15 years of experience working in audio technology. I'm so thrilled that you could join us tonight. Dan, could you share a little bit about yourself with us as well? Yeah, great to be here. So, um, as Magdalena said, I spent 15 years working for companies like Sennheiser, Alesis, um, took a little detour out of the music industry to work on gaming headsets for a little while. Very quickly realized that was not what I loved. Came back to music and audio with Harmon. Um, and then went to start my own podcast, discovered how bad the tools were for making podcasts, and started a podcast creation tools startup called Oxbus that automated and guided people who'd never made audio before through all the steps of podcasting. So I did that for three years and then just recently joined Isotope in March. Well, congratulations on the new position at Isotope. Thank you. So I'm really excited to be coming back up to Boston eventually. The plan was to move up there in April or May and then COVID happened. Um, so what's been great about being on lockdown is my wife and I just had our first child. We had a baby five weeks ago today. Oh my gosh, so congrats. This, thank you. So this time being at home, it's a very weird experience for us because we went from having no money in a startup to making a corporate salary and being comfortable. So that stress was reduced. And then going through this period of I was job searching while the pandemic was setting in. So I had a lot of extra time to really spend with her and get to know her while she was a pregnant lady and to get to spend time with my new baby because Isotope's a great company in terms of culture and gave me six weeks of paternity leave immediately. So the best thing about <laughs> being at home these last few months has been family time. It's been great. That's amazing. Really, really glad to hear that. And Lily, I'm so glad that you could get connected with us again. Um, so Lily Balch is a therapeutic yoga instructor, meditation teacher, and creator and host of the Morning Ritual podcast. Lily, we're so thrilled to have you here. Um, could you share with us your major at Berkeley, um, your grad year, and also what has been the best part of being quarantined at home? Ooh, so first off, having technical issues. So you guys can hear me? Yep. Okay, if my Wi-Fi goes out again, I'll keep trying to get back on. But anyway, so good to be here. My name is Lily, thank you for the intro. And I actually studied at the Boston Conservatory. So I was a dance major. And I, right out of college, I had you know moved to New York City and pursued a, a few years career in modern dance, which I dip a toe in. Um, but then I really shifted my focus to yoga and meditation. And I would say this podcast might be the best thing that came out of quarantine. Cause I, my life switched, I, my work is in person, right? I teach meditation and yoga with private clients, with group classes and I had to pivot and I'm not good at social media. I'm not good at blogging, vlogging, posting, all of that. But I do have things to say and I don't mind my voice. So I was like, let's see if I can create this thing in a matter of days and put it out. And so I launched my first episode on like March 25th and posted every day. And so that's been pretty, that's been pretty cool to like difficult, challenging, still working on figuring stuff out, but that's been a pretty cool, um, positive thing to happen over quarantine. Yeah, that's amazing. Very cool. So last, but certainly not least, we have Fernando Fineta, who does audio mixing, mastering, and sound design, excuse me, for Vox Media Podcast Network show, Pivot featuring hosts Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway. So Fernando, we're so psyched that you're with us tonight. Could you share the same info about you? Like what did you study while you were at Berkeley and what's what's been the best part of quarantine? Uh, sure thing, well, first of all, uh, thank you for having us today here. Um, for, uh, what I did at Berkeley, I majored in uh, CWP and EPD. I graduated in 2015 
um, and like someone said, it's like it hasn't been that long, but it had it for some reason with the <laughs> with the pandemic, it just felt like an eternity since then. But um, uh, some of the things that I have enjoyed while in uh, pandemic mode, I guess, is uh, spending a lot of time with my girlfriend or newly adopted cat. Yay. And also uh, dedicating some time to uh, learning programming, which I hadn't done before. So like trying to develop that extra skill that I have been uh, eyeing for a while. But, yeah. Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, my first question for all of you is actually something that most of you have already spoken to, but I'm sure that you'll have more to add here. So I guess what I'm wondering is in what ways has your podcasting work been affected by the pandemic? And in what ways has it actually stayed pretty much the same? Yeah, please go for it. <laughs> So COVID had a lot to do with the reason that I chose to wind down Oxbus into sort of a maintenance mode. My, this is my startup and take a job because we had this baby on the way. And the way that I bootstrapped the company before we raised money was we did production services, professional production services. So not software automation, but this kind of work that Fernando and, and, and Marcus do, I guess, uh, on their shows for other people. So very quickly when we saw this COVID thing was a real thing, many of those clients said, we just can't justify this being the focus of how we spend our marketing money right now. So we almost in overnight lost half of our business in terms of our pro professional production business. Um, fortunately, the software business continues to grow, even though we aren't able to spend any money on marketing because we've lost that revenue from the professional production services. But um, COVID coming in took away the majority of the revenue that we were making doing those professional production services. And it's pushed me toward this position where uh, I get to take everything I learned building my startup and apply it to a company that's been around for 20 years and has just a ton of respect among our communities. So um, painful at first, but very exciting now. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. Yeah. I can, I can like piggyback a little bit off of specifically in relation to Isotope, because it's literally, uh, you know, Gimlet's operations have pretty much maintained um, as normal, with the one notable exception that everybody has been working remote, um, including all of our hosts, um, and uh, all of the interviews have been done over the phone, and which basically all comes down to meeting that uh, all of the audio that we're used to mixing, which which are recorded in our studios in Brooklyn, uh, which are amazing, and we have like the cleanest signal path you could possibly imagine, and everything sounds really, really good. Uh, it's just all gone now. So I've you know been just thinking, my lucky stars that uh, Isotope RX exists, and I can clean up all of this, you know. I just I just finished mixing um, a pilot this week actually, and it was like just everything like every single interview was was you know just recorded over an iPhone, and it's like incredible that we were able to make this thing sound like almost as good as we would normally make it, um, you know. Uh, but it's it's been a real adjustment, just kind of like getting into this new workflow. I mean, the other thing that is, is sort of tricky is just like being on conference calls with people all day instead of you know, doing mixes in person and getting to actually listen to things, you know, in the same air. It's like a completely different skill communicating over um, over the internet, uh, which I did not realize until, uh, you know, whatever, three, three months ago it was, but yeah. yeah. If I may add to what uh, Marcus said, it, well, on the one side, um, in terms of uh, work, I think it stayed either the same or even more because the the podcast that I'm working on, uh, Pivot, it's uh, it's about um, business and tech. So since the world is basically in a tailspin right now, there's a lot to talk about. So in that regard, there's been a lot of work. But to piggyback of what Marcus said, yeah, I think the one thing that has uh, changed probably. Um, most on my side is just the amount of processing <laughs> in terms of the recordings, yeah, because obviously now with everybody working remotely, um, recordings as are you know less than ideal than they were actually previously. So, but you know, isotope 
RX coming in clutch uh, as always. So just making things sound pristine. <laughs> Yes, yeah. and I, I assure everyone who's viewing, uh, this is not an Isotope RX ad, but it is actually just that good. I don't know. Uh, so I'm sorry, Ray, what were you going to add? I was going to say that it's that good. Um, like the, <laughs> the thing is about RX is that it's the industry standard, and I just don't know of anything else that can do what it does for cleaning up audio when you have non-ideal recording environments. Um, especially the voice to noise and the reflection tool are, are the two that are just necessary in quarantine and i would highly recommend they have great sales all the time this is not like we're not getting paid by this guy <laughs> by dan but it's just it's essential i think to anyone who's trying to produce around a, a home environment um so like a little background about the project i've been working on for the past six months um is part of um Sundance has been trying to get into podcasting. So this is the third year that they've teamed up with the BBC um, to produce five audio documentaries. And I just held up four, like three fingers because I'm, I don't know, it's quarantine. But um, one of them is, is mine, um, which has been really fun because it gets a lot of different things that I love. I get to do um, scoring and sound design and recording and, and I get to do the narration. And I was a voice principal at Berkeley. So that has been a big part of my my love of this is the art of just narration, which is really fun and just talking and you know, all of that. Um, and and a lot of those have been fine remotely. Like that's not it. A lot of that industry has moved to laptops in the past couple of years anyway. Um, and the biggest change is that now I can't get to the studio for most of my stuff, and I have to rely on RX. And and that's been you know a godsend. Um, yeah, once again, not a commercial. No one's paying me for this. <laughs> I would gladly accept plugins, you know. <laughs> but, oh my but, goodness. Uh, um, so go go RX. <laughs> That's my yeah. Goal. Yeah, I think. Um, um, I was just, oh, please, please. I yeah, please. No, I was going to say I don't know a pre-COVID podcast world, so I am excited for the day that I can actually do interviews in person, especially because I it's a meditation podcast, but I do, and I'll talk about those topics either with someone or just sort of expressing them myself, but to do the interviews in person, what I feel like will just be much more rich, and yeah, I'm excited. Uh, and Lily, actually, I had a question that you just led into really wonderfully, which is, um, I guess, can you tell us a little bit more about your experience of starting a show? What was, uh, what were some of the most challenging parts of that? And do you have any advice for new podcasters who are trying to do the same? Oh, yeah. So I, um, I'm not the most organized gal. I get I have all these ideas, I get really pumped about them, and then to actually see them come alive is a whole nother story. But I was like, it's called the morning ritual. It's like 10 minutes every morning. I pictured it, I was like, quick meditation, different scenes. Like I saw the overarching idea and I knew exactly what I wanted to do, but I'm not a tech person. I'm, you know, like I've said before, social media, marketing, blah, blah, blah not my thing. I'm a performing artist, dancer, yoga teacher. Um, so I just got super clear. I think it was the fun part was getting super clear on my title, knowing a graphic designer who could do my artwork for me, um, doing all the fun creative bits of it. And I did that first so that the inspiration fueled the challenges that I faced, which was um, learning how to record and what microphone to get. And this was all just Googling and talking to people. And um, I spent it, you know, I spent a, like 150, 200 on my first mic. And I was like, I don't know if you guys more experienced in the world. I don't know if that's like where a good starting point is. Like you could probably go cheaper, but I wanted it to be good. And once it came in, I spent days just playing around. So I would like record, I downloaded um, Hindenburg Journalist, which I know you could edit on like Audacity and like all these things. Oh, baby. <laughs> and 
And I just played around on different programs with my mic in different places and, and played with editing and just taught myself over a weekend because I was so fueled by my clear idea of what I wanted to do. Um, and I just put stuff out there and my first few episodes sound horrible and are like kind of not organized, but just put it out there and it play and, and it becomes, I'm learning something new every time I, I post and I post every day. Yeah, oh, that's, that's really amazing and very inspiring. That is a super fast turnaround time. An episode a day is very ambitious indeed. I want to um, definitely talk some more about gear a little bit later on, but for now I want to sort of talk about the next step. Once you have the gear and you have the show idea, then what? Or even if you don't have the gear and don't have the show idea, but you just really love podcasting, how do you then transfer that into a career or a hobby? Um, so Ray, I'd love to hear from you a little bit about how, because you're a freelancer, like how you have networked and sought after uh, employment opportunities in this field? Like where, where, do you yeah. work? where do you start? It's been really confusing because it's like no one laid out this course at Berkeley. You know, it's like kind of a new industry. So it's been a lot of really just going out there and thinking about what are the skills that I need to do to be in control of my art. And a lot of that these days um, has been film scoring and mixing and mastering and composing. Um, so, so those are the, the actual toolkits and to get, um, networked, I basically just showed up at a studio, uh, for two years and, and they paid me after a while, but for a while they didn't, um, a soundtrack in Boston, uh, which is a really great studio. Um, and they do like, uh, like Bob's Burgers, they record Eugene there. They do like a lot of the Ken Burns, um, mi mixing and mastering. Um, and they have a sister studio in New York that does a lot of really A-list Hollywood stuff. Um, and they have they they were the, the first place to really help teach me what are the different roles in post-production. Um, and that's really where my lens was kind of crafted is through this idea of post-production and audio, which is kind of like a specific field. Um, but there's a lot of specific fields in it. Um, and it's hard to pick which one to sort of enter and where to get your feet kind of grounded. And that's where mine really were grounded. Um, so that was a lot of voiceover for commercials and um, sound design for commercials, um, a lot of Toyota commercials, and just watching the process of that and getting really used to the process of that. And then I um, I was told about tape syncing, which was really essential. Um, I got uh, networked into some of these, there's these big Google groups, and I would really love to share some of this information if people want to reach out to me after this, um, where a lot of public radio post jobs um, some of them are called uh, Radio NYC, but you can get added to this list and there's constantly jobs available being posted. So um, so I was always looking, how do I switch from being a sound designer and a, and a recording artist person to, not a recording artist, but a, a recorder and an engineer to a producer? And what's this like jump and how do you make that jump and what are the producers doing? Um, and it was really kind of, um, helpful to do all the different jobs along the way of doing sound design. I got to score and, and do the mixing and mastering for an audio documentary last year that um, actually got uh, very well reviewed and Vanity Fair just wrote an article about it last week and, and it's still getting attention um, a year later, which is really exciting. Um, but the understanding mixing and sound design and, and working for years to get to the level where I can do that professionally has really helped be a for me, become a better producer because I understand all these different parts of the production process from personal experience. And so now that I'm doing my own project and I actually get to work with the BBC on how is it that I take these skills and, and sharpen them for um, for actually my, my first project, the, the audience that they're developing this for is for the BBC World Service. And that's where it's gonna air for 97 million people um, and a lot of the stuff that I've been learning about how to tell a story now is how do you tell a story for an audience that's bigger than America that doesn't know what Memorial Day is and doesn't care and doesn't know what a hobo is and doesn't know what a lot of these things that are I just don't even recognize are a part of my culture. But that it turns out is being a producer is learning how to think outside of your box and how to pull together interviews and, and all this fun stuff. And um, I, I, 
I, I think that the best thing that I've done in, in learning about how to break into the industry is working for years at all these different parts of the industry um, and really respecting those parts so that I can really have the, the kind of um, attention to detail that I want for my projects. Um, so uh, that, that would be my only shred of advice or how I, I've sort of gone about it. Um, yeah, and, and I think what you're what you're sharing is actually a theme that I've I've seen both in my own personal network and just Berkeley alumni in general, which is this uh, sort of the personality that it takes to just show up and maybe get paid or don't get paid, but you're learning new skills and you're going to do all these things that you never thought you were going to do along the way, like Toyota commercials. Maybe that's not your dream, but maybe it leads you to where you want to be and um, it's, I think that you've done a great job of speaking to the multifaceted nature of the podcasting industry and the road to, to getting to where you are now. And actually, again, set me up perfectly for my next question, which was actually for Marcus, because you're someone who has it's worn a lot of hats to um, podcasting. No, the podcasting. So, so I would love to know, like, I would love to know, like, what ways Berkeley what ways has Berkeley specifically prepped you for this work and for this work? And what were some of the things that you just had to learn, like to learn, like on the field, on the field? Um, yeah. So it's it's a it's a definitely a mixed bag um, because, as I mentioned, what I studied at Berkeley was was film scoring um, and songwriting, um, and actually the way that I got into podcasting specifically was because I was writing music. So I, when I got out of Berkeley, I um, kind of was kicking around a little bit and I assisted another composer by the name of Marcelo Zarfos, um, which is uh, how I ended up working on The Affair and Ray Donovan and a couple other TV shows. Um, and then when I stopped working for Marcelo, I just sort of by chance ended up talking to actually another Berkeley alumni, Marty Fowler, who also does a lot of music for podcasts. Um, and and we were talking and I was like, yeah, like what's the deal with this um, podcasting thing? And he's like, I was like, I, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. Like I just I just stopped working for Marcelo and I'm sort of trying to figure out what my path forward is uh, towards anything. And he's like, well, I just met Ira Glass um, at an at an event and they're looking for composers do you want me to pass your name along and i was like yeah sure and and i think you know i i wouldn't necessarily have have gotten that job if not for the fact that uh, this american life had been using a bunch of marcello's music um for for like years um and they just happened to see his name on my resume and they you know gave me a shot to write music for them um so like in that respect like the the composing thing uh, I learned uh, at Berkeley and then obviously that sort of like carried me towards the podcast industry um, but then once I, I sort of started writing for This American Life um, and I sort of started to discover this world of podcasting I realized that this the role that a composer plays typically uh, when it comes to a podcast is very different from um, traditionally what you sort of expect from like a film scoring perspective. Uh, and what I ended up finding out is that for the most part, it's the engineer who, who does the music as well. Um, either placing pre-existing music or um, in the case of the sort of like shows that I was really excited about, um, in a lot of cases, the engineers were also composing the music and putting them in the show. So I realized that I had to learn how to be an engineer, um, which it's something that I hadn't learned at Berkeley because I wasn't something that I realized I was interested in. So basically, I spent you know a lot of time learning how to mix and do like post sound and, and stuff like that, and kind of teaching myself. Um, and yeah, it's it's a it's an interesting field though because it is. And I, Ray mentioned this. It's still really new. Um, so this idea that there's like a specific set of skills that you need to like enter this industry is like starting to coalesce but it's not it's not there yet um and it certainly wasn't there when i started i mean you know whatever like eight years ago um but it's you know it's a it's really exciting to be in that sort of place where suddenly things are becoming more official and 
suddenly like it just in the last couple of years there's so much more money in podcasts than there ever had been before like the possibilities for you know i'm really into the, specifically the music thing but up until you know last year i had never had enough money to hire musicians to play on any of the music that i was writing for stuff um and you know now now there is so it's it's really it's it's like a cool place to be <laughs> for sure um yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. So I would love to pass the mic to Fernando for a moment because like, you know, all of the panelists here, really, you're someone that occupies a number of different roles in the podcasting world, both mixing, mastering, sound design, and more, I'm sure. So could you tell me a little bit more about what your workflow looks like and how you manage that and maybe even what like a typical day of work looks like for you? Sure. I mean, I think that that differs. The, I guess the term sound designer or also audio engineer. Well, first of all, I think that in the podcasting kind of area, that those terms are a little bit uh, more encompassing, like how Marcus was saying. Um, for instance, uh, you find on, on job boards that say audio engineer one for podcast or sound designer one for podcast, and then you find this laundry list of, of basically. Uh, very distinct skills that that we uh, maybe learn about at Berkeley, but we're like, whoa, like this was a whole different major. Like, how do we like how do we combine these two things? So, um, in terms, I think that 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 position varies from podcast to podcast, and I can say my own personal experience. I I worked in, in two podcasts specifically, the uh, Cafe Insider podcast, and then my position as I guess freelance audio engineer was to um, edit uh, I will get the edits from the producer and sorry get a session from the producer with a with a list of edits that I that needed to be done I also could take some uh, creative freedom depending on 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 how the the podcast flowed it was a, a two-way conversation on that one and also after those edits were done basically uh, it's a back and forth between me and the producers um, they listen to a rough mix uh, do some extra edits maybe fact check a couple of things uh, make some final cuts, then send it back to me. I uh, mix and master, make sure things are polished and, and ready to go, and then send it back. They approve it, and then that goes off to publishing. And then the other podcast that I'm uh, currently working on is the Pivot by the Box Media Podcast Network. And that one is a little bit more straightforward in terms of what I get to do, which is uh, straight up uh, mixing and mastering on a regular basis. So what my a day, a normal day looks like uh, with them is they take care of the recording. Everybody's like all over the place, like the, meaning <laughs> the interviewers, they're like all over the US. So everything gets done uh, remotely. And then the producer works with the executive producer to um, make sure that the cuts are the one that are good to go. And then they send that over to me. And then I spend about three to four hours to, um, um, you know, do some uh, cleanup with RX, uh, extensive cleanup and processing, and then uh, mix and master a uh, podcast that's about an hour long, and then also um, mix um, ads, there's usually ads that need to be mixed, and then I make sure that I uh, import music from, from a, a licensing uh, website that we use, and then uh, make sure that everything's ready to go, and then that gets uh, uploaded the next morning. Um, I also cover some, I guess, sound design and uh, composition duties, but those are more, um, they're not on like same day kind of deal. So we've discussed um, the, the, like the flow of the podcast and, and determine like where new music could be used, where new ideas could be implemented. And then when there's downtime, I go down and then uh, write music depending on the specifications that we talk about. Uh, maybe stingers here and there, um, and then present that to the executive producer, and then we basically do a test run um, with the following uh, episodes and see and see what the reaction is, and then determine if we are going to continue using those, uh, let's say, uh, stingers or or music. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much it. That's that's how my uh, normal day goes with Pivot. Um, it's very funny because you're like, yeah, that's pretty much it. That was a <laughs> hundred things that you just listed. And, and I think that 
this is an important thing to sort of emphasize to uh, podcast listeners that there are so many stages that audio undergoes from raw audio to a finished prod product. So many hands touch that and, and, and it can be quite complicated, especially once you get into some of the larger budgets for sure. But I would love to just sort of like scale things down and scale things back for a moment and talk about what I suspect might be a favorite topic in this group, which is gear. So I would love to just maybe have all of you talk a bit about what uh, your home setup is like now that you're working from home and anything that you would recommend for a beginner podcaster who maybe is on a tight budget and maybe anything you wouldn't recommend too if you see some common mistakes happening. Uh, Dan, I would love to hear from you first if that's all right. Sure, and I apologize if the bouncing is distracting. I'm trying to keep this baby quiet. So apologies, there's no real-time RX to take her out yet. Um, so one of the things we were talking about before the panelists were talking before this session got started is this microphone I'm using. This is an Audio-Technica, sorry, AT-875R. It's a short shotgun. It's about $160. It's cheap. It's nothing special. But when we started going to working from home, and for me, I've been working from home for a big chunk of the last decade, I realized I wanted to upgrade how I showed up on Zoom and other remote platforms like GoToMeeting. So we just did blindfold shootouts. I had an SM7B, I had an RE20, I had you know all the standard radio microphones. I tried some nice condenser microphones. And I just found for this untreated room, because I'm just in a bedroom in my house, um, it's this, a shotgun happens to work well because it has a lot of off axis rejection. Um, so for people who are able to stay in place, and I realize I'm not doing that right now, <laughs> it's a really great choice. Um, a lot of consumers or a lot of first time podcasters will come to you asking you about lavaliers and they typically sound terrible as I'm sure the engineers know because they're, they're really designed for stage use. They're designed for Omni pickup. I, I also would say, don't, don't, start out if you're just getting started you don't need a $400 RH20 or a $400 SM7B those microphones are nice but the last 10% of sound quality is really for you and not for your listeners they're probably listening with airpods on the train with background noise with one ear out so the most important thing as far as gear in my opinion is remove audio distractions you want the audio to be good enough not to get in the way of the story so I say find a microphone that you like your 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 mic your find a microphone you like your voice in and don't worry about upgrading the audio gear until you have 10,000 listeners and you are able to sell ads in your show and uh you're you're able to use that revenue to upgrade your setup. I you know that might not be a popular answer but that's as somebody who spent 15 years in audio gear that's my answer. <laughs> Nice. Any other any other thoughts on gear? Thoughts on gear. I, I would just add. I, first of all, Dan just nailed it. Um, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, but what I would I would just add to that is the one thing, especially as I've been like dealing with host audio um, from from Gimlet that's been like in people's apartments is like the finding a room that that. It doesn't have lots of reflections and isn't really echoey is really important um, in terms of sound quality. You, the, the actual like mic doesn't matter so much. I mean, I, and I think as Dan mentioned, like certain mics are going to be more directional and have projection that works better in different spaces and whatnot. But um, just finding a room that works whether you're sitting in your closet like uh, apparently Ira Glass has been doing you know through this or you know just something like that um, is gonna do more for your audio than having like a really nice microphone or, or not. Um, you know it, it that's that's huge and also having I mean this is more like on the higher end like if you have a really nice mic but you don't have a nice like clean preamp that's a whole other thing so it's like Nail, nail the first bit, get a good room, have something that sounds good enough, and then, like Dan said, then think about upgrading later on. Because um, it it's true, like, I hate to say it as an engineer and someone who, like, fixates over how making stuff sound really good, but 
most people are listening, you know, before they're listening on the subway, on earbuds. You know, Apple earbuds sound pretty good, but like, you know, they certainly don't sound as good as, you know, the headphones that I would normally mix on or, you know, so don't, don't get really freaked out by worrying about like what's gonna be perfect and what's not. Just make it so people aren't distracted. As Dan said, it's, it's, you just nailed it. If I could add a little bit to what Marcus said, um, I think uh, also to the listeners, uh, the getting a good room doesn't necessarily mean like having panels like I have uh, back here. Like if you have a, well, I don't know if in New York, I don't know if you have a closet, you may not, but if you do have a closet, um, that could be a great a great space to uh, record record your audio without having uh, all those annoying yeah, all those annoying yeah. yeah, or even having a quilt. Sorry, say again. Even under a quilt um, works for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if I could, I guess, um, sure. I, I I am of the thought that you don't really need uh, necessarily expensive gear to uh, get this thing going, but if I could recommend one thing, maybe it would be a good meter, um, like the WLM Plus by Waves. That's the one that I use. If you could, like, you know, if you, your DAW probably supplies everything that you need to make a good mix, but a good meter, I think uh, Logic has one already, so uh, I might have to double check that. Um, you know, just to make sure that your final output is meeting the, the, the specs of the platform that you're going to submit it to. Uh, other than that, your DAW will most likely have everything you need. Um, I love the WLM meter. It's the only one that I use. I don't know. There's, you know, there's, I guess, yep. um, if people don't know what that is, um, it's like metering and leveling. There's a lot of specs country by country and for broadcast, for podcast versus television of how loud you can be. Um, and you could just, you know, turn your speakers up and not necessarily remember where you are in, in the volume world. Sometimes people get a little lost. So the, the meters are really important because they keep you um, honest about where your mix is. Um, so I would definitely recommend getting that plugin over spending money on preamps at this stage because basically what you need to have a podcast is you need a microphone and you need a computer these days. And if you want to get fancy in between those two, you can put an interface, but there's a lot of built-in preamp microphones like Yeti from Blue um, where it's just a USB mic and it's it's fine you're it's going to be fine if you spend more time finding a really less reflection-y part of your room instead of adding $200 of gear that you might not understand yet and would have to learn about I would say that you're not doing yourself a favor um, so really just get one of the USB mics they're like 150 bucks that's fine go clapping in your room the reflection helps because when you have a lot of reflection, it sounds like the person's kind of far away from you. And when the voice is right up close, you can EQ it however you want and you can hide it with stuff and it's just easier to duck, but no one really, it's fine. You know, having some reflection, people understand it's its fine. But, but if you get one of those levels, the WLM meter, and then you kind of understand how to do each of the steps, I think that's a really professional setup and you could have it for like 200 bucks, you know, and a 10 minute YouTube video and you're good to go. It sounds, I'm sure it'll be great. Um, yeah, yeah. Hey, that, I took that approach. I have yeah, a I love my, it. It's I'm in my closet with clothes around me and my partner and my dog, we're all <laughs> working from home. My dog doesn't work yet, but you know, we're all making noise at home. So sometimes I have to put the quilt on as well. Yeah. But, it sounds okay. Sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I, lo I love hearing, just about, say, hearing about these. One more stuff. thing. Oh, please, please. Um, I think now more than ever is the best time to have podcasts that don't necessarily sound completely pristine because everybody knows we're doing things remotely. So, you know what? Maybe now is the time to just go for it. Don't think too much about it if you have an idea. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. Um, very, very cool. Well, I just want to remind everyone who's tuning in that you should feel free to ask questions to our panelists. You can use the chat feature or the questions feature. Thank you to those of you who have already submitted questions. We will get to that in just a minute. I have just one final question for our panel today. We've spoken a lot about audience, right? Um, everyone's in a pandemic, so we're all in a certain 
certain place of mind. And uh, Ray, you were speaking earlier about, you know, having an audience globally and, and what do audiences in different countries uh, understand or relate to culturally. And I, I think that this is a really important topic. And so I actually had a question specifically regarding your approach to audience nowadays. So like in light of the current conversations around social justice and the black experience in America, what can you tell us about how the podcasting industry and even you all as individual podcasting professionals are responding to these issues? Uh, personally, um, just to kind of like run with this here, um, I, so I've been working on a project for six months, which is about, it's a, it's a documentary style podcast and it's focused on telling the story of this one old guy and tracing him and his history through America. And he's a hobo and, you know, you'll find out in August more about it if you'd like to listen. Um, but, uh, it's, it's been really, uh, difficult to not bring it up, um, especially because a lot of the social justice issues have kind of crashed into my story because my subject lived three miles um, from where uh, George Floyd was murdered. And so we've actually pulled it into the narrative um, a bit more. Uh, and and I've, I've actually tried to keep the pandemic away, but because it's a story about where is America in 2020, it's it's become part of the conversation, even though that's not what the story was originally supposed to be and that's not what we set down to do um, but one of the things that they've been very um insistent on uh at the bbc which has been really great because I've, I've never worked with like a big network before like them um is that you have to roll with the punches and understand how to integrate new things as they happen on the ground and make sure that you're still telling an honest story while you react to things um and it, it's it's hard to do that in a way that's respectful, and, and it's not. Um, I, and I don't I don't really have so much of an opinion about it, just so much as I'm trying to, to sort of deal with that now. We have about two weeks left until this project is done, and there's still some things in the air about how we approach this, um, because the whole world is talking about it. It's not just an American conversation. Absolutely, every country understands what's going on and is involved, and it's not something. Um, that is just part of the, the American conversation right now. Um, and uh, I, it, yeah, I, it's, it's a really, I, I don't even know how to go about it. Um, I'm, I, I would love to hear some other people about how do you respectfully engage in a conversation that needs to be talked about without pulling focus away from it into yourself. Um, and I don't know what, yeah, uh, what that is or, or how to do it in a, in a way that's really good for, for the conversation. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I think everyone needs to be thinking about constantly. Um, that's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, for, because I do post every, every day and I, I, I record the day before, so it's very in time. Um, depending on what's going on globally, locally, and internally um, really drives the content for, for mine because it's a meditation podcast. So I been I did a whole week, I took a week off just honoring um, my, just taking time to like do my own research and studying on um, the Black Lives Matter movement. And then uh, my content was specific on looking inwards, asking maybe difficult questions and feeling what you're feeling. So it was quite, um, it's challenging to like find your voice in a moment that's so powerful. Um, Cause that, you know, you every time I, I, I have something to say, I'm like, I, I don't know if I'm giving it justice, my opinions or the situation. So it's definitely challenging, but um, I, I guess I'm saying because I do post so regularly and so it, in the moment it has to be affected by what's going on. Yeah. I would add, so, because I'm not like specifically like ever like the voice writing or speaking in, in our shows, but some things that I've observed in the last couple of weeks, I've been working on this pilot, which I can't like, 
talk about specifically, but what I can say is that it's been interesting because um, a couple of the episodes uh, were centering on um, some pieces of, of like the, the black experience in America. And it wasn't specifically about what's going on right now, um, but some of the people that we interviewed um, talked about it regardless in the interviews. Um, and these are like very like produced, you know, audio stories. Um, you know, so it could have been the type of thing where we talked about this stuff and then we just we just didn't use it, you know, as we're putting these stories together. Um, but there was like a conscious um, decision to, you know, like leave these musings and conversations, you know, with these folks in about like tying what these episodes were about in their words to like what's going on right now. And I thought that was like a in a nice way um, and a and a good way to kind of like center some voices that aren't necessarily particularly our own and sort of speaking on what's going on um, without like yeah because I just it is normally like like when you're do like when you're working with interviews you'd like oh we're going off topic you're like you know you're noting like okay we're gonna cut this we're not gonna work with this and it's like just leaving a little more in and giving people you know space to talk about stuff um, it's it's interesting and i think it you know ultimately like ended up uh changing how we were producing these episodes in a, in a way that like you know if this pilot gets greenlit i'm really excited for it to like people to hear it because <laughs> um it's it felt felt like good you know as, as someone who's on that production team yeah, that's very interesting. Well, I really appreciate uh, the vulnerability and openness that you that you all brought to to answering that question because I know that there really isn't an answer, right? We just are observing things and maybe taking a bit more of a critical look at our own work now. And so I appreciate that. Um, in the interest of time, though, I do want to move on to some of our attendees' questions for all of you. We have a lot, so I don't think we're going to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as we can. Um, so let's start with this. Um, do you have any advice on how to grow your audience? <laughs> it's hard for everyone. <laughs> the, easiest, the easiest, cheapest way to do this is be a guest on other similar shows so that you can make their audiences aware of you that costs you nothing aside from your time to send out a bunch of emails to the hosts of those shows. And it gives you an opportunity to share what you do with people that have never heard of you. Uh, the last thing you should do is spend a whole bunch of money on paid media. That's something that you can do once you already have 5,000 listeners to every episode and you wanna to get to 10,000. But to start out, you've gotta go grassroots and it's gotta be roll up your sleeves and, and put in a lot of kind of elbow grease and and hard like uh street fighting work yeah i i hear this question a lot um i've been to like a, a couple of like podcast fest festivals and and people are always like how do we do and, and i'm part of like a lot of facebook groups where people are always like how do we grow our audiences and i just i never want to ask that question i i think that podcasting is the only industry where you can be super laser focused on this really niche community and just like serve that community really focused and 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 uh, and with your full heart and and that will actually somehow translate to monetary something um that and and really focusing on the skills that you have that make podcasts your your mastering your post your scoring all of that making sure that that's really top notch and top then notch yeah and then <laughs> Yeah. Sorry, there was a little feedback. Um, Sorry, there was a little but, feedback. Um, but does everyone hear that? Does an echo in the, an echo in the, yeah. yeah, I'm done then. I'm done then. <laughs> no, that's such a good point. And I think, yeah, it's like, don't don't worry about your audience. Just make a really good show. I mean, you should worry about your audience a little bit, like getting it out there. But if if the work is good, you know, there's a there's not that. Awesome. Well, our attendee who asked that question says thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I love this next question because I'm a digital file preservation nerd. So how important do you find file management? <laughs> Are you using your Are own, you using your own, own or gaming, gaming conventions or some gaming type of conventions? Or some type of I'd be happy to speak to that. It's huge. It's, I mean, 
coming from like someone who like works at like a big company like there's usually like the teams that i work on are like upwards of between like seven to ten people and having like really 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 clear and specific file naming is like the entire thing um especially if you're working in pro tools um you'll know that like it's really easy for if you know somebody's like dragging files from wherever else into sessions and stuff and then suddenly they're passing things to other people and files are missing and things are you know it's like you have to be super super organized all the time um specifically i found that um making sure that uh you have like you always have the date um in your file names so that you it's easy to reference and find stuff from a particular time being really clear with version numbers um and also like resaving as much as possible like if you have you know every time you make an edit resave and so you have like a virtual like archive of everything that you've done um so you know if you ever have to roll it back to a point you know that's always really helpful and good in terms of like file stuff um but yeah it's just i don't know if there's like any like specific wisdom beyond just being clear um i'm sure other people might have other ideas but just the just as long as like if you're working with other people specifically like just make sure that everyone is like on the same page about how things are supposed to look because if if not you're you know you're going to run into problems real quick yeah i don't know about all of you but i definitely have like a file graveyard on my computer that's like zoom zero zero eight one two <laughs> um so very very good advice thank you marcus um so this next question is around uh the experiences that you've all had working in both documentary reporting style podcasts as well as more creative podcasts so um i actually want to just encourage this attendee to visit the Eventbrite page for this event and look at your website um, of these panelists because everyone has worked in so many different projects. It would take hours to go through all of that, but I do encourage all of you viewing, not just the question asker, um, to check out the work of everyone on this panel. It will be well worth your time and will probably lead you to some new listening. Um, so yeah, so let's move on to the next question. Um, is there any, do you, any of you have any advice or suggestions of choosing a hosting and distribution platform? I've heard, of a, really. I've heard of a couple ones, um, Anchor, Podbean. Um, I, I think there's, there's, you should just sort of go with your gut for that one. I, I don't have any specific advice. I, yeah. Yeah, I would, <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's gonna be like a a personal preference thing. It's like, I think you just wanna look at the features they have and if it sounds good to you, like, great. I, I know some people are like really into analytics. So like, if you're into analytics, then look for a platform that has really good analytics. If you don't care, maybe you could spend less money on hosting and then you could go with something else. But it's just gonna, they're all like the end result is all the same so it's really just about like what you're getting um in terms of sort of bonus features like an rss feed is an rss feed there's not like quality bonuses or you know you're just gonna just upload and it's good to go so it's about what you want <laughs> you know that. i think to build a little bit on what marcus on what marcus did, said got a little echo got a little echo there we go. Uh, there are more than 50 hosting companies. They all do the same thing. They all basically sell you storage space on some computer somewhere else, and they generate an RSS feed. And anything else beyond that is bonus features, as Marcus said. RSS is the technology that underlies how you can subscribe to and receive the new podcast episodes each time a new episode comes out. It's the same technology used for blogs. And they all do the same thing. So I think the most important thing to consider <laughs> pardon the juggling, is you want a hosting company that you believe has the financial capability to be around as long as your show will, because that's where your, that, that's your connection to Apple, Google, Spotify, the places where people listen to your show. So as I mentioned, there's more than 50 hosting companies that all do the same thing. At some point, three quarters of those 50 are going to go out of business. So I think it's very important to choose a hosting company that either has the financial reserves and resources to survive 
the consolidation that's happening in podcasting right now. There's lots of mergers and acquisitions happening right now and or is going to be one of those companies that gets acquired by one of the bigger players. So for an, for example, Spotify acquired Anchor. Anchor is one of the biggest hosts of new newly created shows, um, mostly amateur shows, but also some really big shows. So that's a great example of a company that, you know, it was a startup, but it was acquired by one of the largest audio technology companies in the world. So it's not going anywhere. So not trying to lead you toward Anchor as a particular recommendation, just using it as an example. Um, there won't be 50 hosting companies around five years from now. There will probably be four, like Amazon, Netflix, Google, Apple, probably, Spotify. Sorry, Marcus. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you all so much. We are out of time. Um, so, but I just want to thank you all again for tuning in on the attendee side. And then again, I want to thank Ray, Fernando, Marcus, Willie, and Dan for being here tonight and offering your experience and your knowledge. This was so this enlightening. Was so enlightening. I'm so sorry about this strange echo. <laughs> this echo. Um, but in any case, I encourage our viewers today, if you have any other questions about today's, events, questions about today's events, events. events, please feel free to reach out to us at alumniaffairs at berkeley.edu. Thanks again, everyone. And I hope you uh, I hope have you. a good rest of your pandemic. That sounds terrible. That sounds terrible. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, great to meet you all. Great Take care. Meet you all. Take care. Have a good one. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys.